Welcome to SHIFT, a college admissions ACT and SAT podcast for a changing world. I'm Tyler, the founder of Achievable, and we have an affordable ACT course that uses memory-based adaptive learning technology to get you better results in less time. You can get a free trial by going to achievable.me, and if you like it, use the code podcast to get 10% off. Also, if you have a question or topic you'd like us to discuss in a future episode, please contact me at tyler at achievable.me with the subject line podcast topic. Now, let's get started. Today, we've got Gabriel Caden uh, from Westchester Prep, and I'd love if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more um, about you and your company. Sure. Yeah. So uh, thank you for having me. I am the assistant director at Great Minds Advising. We are a firm based out of Westchester, New York, but we serve kids all over the country remotely. And I help to organize and direct our team, build curriculum for our application boot camps. I have a slate of my own students that I advise each cycle that I'm very lucky to work with. And then I work in recruitment as well for our amazing advisor team. And then just a bit about my academic background, I went to New York University's Tisch School of the Arts and I double majored in acting and English. So in my work as a professional actor and writer, I have seen so many parallels and ways in which my artistic work intersects with my consulting work. Um, and that's been just like a cool discovery in, in the recent years. Uh, and then a bit about our company. We are a boutique college consulting firm. We began the firm in the pandemic. So we've had a crazy roller coaster firsthand experience in um, observing all the dynamics and changes that have gone into admissions since um, COVID and post COVID. Our students are amazing. They inspire me every single day. And we have had very good outcomes um, in some of the most competitive admission cycles in history. So we've had students go on to be accepted and attend Stanford, Columbia, Yale, Penn, Duke, Vanderbilt, on and on. Um, applications at Stanford saying one of our students have had the best applications they've seen. So we've we've seen some really cool results and I feel very lucky to be a part of it. Fantastic. Yeah, and I think that that's a lot of it has to do with your guys' philosophy and attention to detail. Um, for the listeners, you guys might not know this. Uh, well, you wouldn't know this, uh, but of all the people that we've had on the show, you guys have sent the most detailed notes of anybody. <laughs> so you're very thorough, which I think is awesome. Um, and today we're going to well, be talking... Uh, also, you, um, you mentioned... Tran- your translatable skills, right, from the art world when you were talking about um, just like your background and how you've kind of parlayed it into this. And I thought that's a really interesting and a nice segue into what we're going to talk about today, right? Um, and talking about how you can, you know, how to do res- resume building and then also how to sort of line up the skills on your resume with the skills that are going to essentially be like, college admission, not worthy, that's not the right word, maybe like exciting to admissions officers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think just a bit of background about the way that we think about resume building and kind of how the creativity dovetails into that whole process. We have seen in the the past few years, so many cliche activities. We speak with families and we have just witnessed um, a dominant narrative of families who do and guide their kids in pursuing activities that are extremely cliche. We see a plethora of pre-college programs. We see student council and leadership. And there's nothing inherently bad necessarily about those activities, but they're just very cliche. They're not, they're very popular. They're not Mm -hmm. extremely unique. There's typically a low bar for entry for those programs or those activities. You can imagine There are thousands and thousands of high schools all around the country. Every high school has a student council. So it's a little bit hard to differentiate yourself if you are one of many, many, many kids that are pursuing that kind of very well-rounded general activity in the context Mm. of school. There's not very much of a focus um, in pursuing activities such as those. Um, And then additionally, some of these activities don't really offer a very optimal opportunity to build nuance and specialty in a particular academic area, which is what selective colleges want to see nowadays. It's not 25 years ago where it's lauded um, that you come in as a well-rounded applicant and you can be undecided. It is very much a different landscape, especially in uh, selective college admissions these days. And so you very much want to demonstrate a particular excellence and specialty in an area. And there are many activities that are that work in counter to that particular goal. 
Um, and then additionally, some of these programs, the pre-college programs especially, they're very highly priced and there's often very low selectivity when it comes to being admitted, which can be pretty suspect to a college. They know these programs, they're very aware of the way in which they're marketed and the way in which they're priced. And so it can work against a student oftentimes to sign up for activities with a brand name college, often when you know they, they really do need to be working on building a specialty. And then finally, I'd say college brand names on a resume sometimes can work against a student in that it can dim, demonstrate um, demonstrated interest. It could be a signal of demonstrated interest that could work against a student in an admissions process where they're putting in applications to many schools. And then you have a brand name on your resume from some sort of pre-college program. And all of a sudden you're tipping your hat to a college that you're actually not putting in an ED to. And it can confuse the college sometimes um, on a more nuanced level as to where your loyalty, loyalty may lie. So those are some of the, the concerns that we have with cliche activities. And we think it's really important that students work to demonstrate a unique and interesting spike um, in their narrative. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that's because test optional policies have totally taken over um, and decreased the reliance on metrics and increase the reliance that colleges um, have on building or, or evaluating a, a resume that's that's unique um so in service of that mission in service of supporting students in building an excellence and in building a unique and nuanced narrative and resume we have found that it's extremely important to find a focus early and to find a way in which you articulate your personal ethos and passion and mm -hmm. the way to do this most effectively and most compellingly is to find people in the world, professionals that exist all over the country, all over the world, that have similar interests and similar missions and values and say, hey, we'd love to partner. I'd love to partner with you. Is there an internship I could take part in? Is there a volunteership that I could take part in to support the mission, the nonprofit, the endeavor that you've taken on um, that I also believe in? Right. And I think, I mean, you touched on a couple of important things here. Um, I, I feel like the the first is that, you know, for better or for worse, like everybody has an A average now, um, or it, not everybody, but certainly if you're applying to like a, a very selective school, it's highly likely that like everyone's going to have a GPA north of like 3.7, 3.8, probably 3.9. Um, I mean, I even like, you know, in just casual conversations that I have with high school teachers, you know, they, you know, if they give a student a C, like the parents come in and try to like, basically like complain <laughs> about the fact that their kid got a C. Right, it's right. like, well, if your kid did the work, they wouldn't have gotten a C, right? Um, it's just, it's unfortunate, but that's like the playing field right now. And you have to kind of play the game that's on the field. Um, and then with test optional, yeah, there are less metrics for schools, right? So I think that um, the second piece that I wanted to talk about that you touched on here is this idea of finding a, finding your passion and that passion being the, the center of your college admissions process because I think that the colleges would prefer and I think that frankly the world would be better if students were pursuing their passion because they actually cared and not yes. because they're trying to get into college. Right. So, I mean, when you guys are working with somebody, maybe early enough in the process that there's a little bit of time, like how do you get them to kind of unpack what they want to be thinking about or focused on as they're, uh, you know, going into, say, junior year of high school and college admissions is kind of around the corner, but they also have a little bit of time to start to think about this and like pursue what they're interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have a lot of different tactics, um, but one one main one we would say is that we ask students to evaluate evaluate what it is that they do without thinking about it. When you know the the clock is running and they lose track of time, what is it that you're doing in that moment where you kind of forget that time exists? Um, what kind of YouTube rabbit holes do you go on? Um, where do you, what do you gravitate toward when you are in a bookstore 
and you're looking around at all the titles. What are the stories? What are the narratives? What are the, who are the people that you're gravitating towards? What kind of thought leaders are you passionate about? Who do you follow? Who, what kind of causes would you, would you die for? I mean, that's a little dramatic, but it's kind of true is um, what are you so innately passionate about and drawn to? I mean, for myself, I remember being a kid in a bookstore and I remember the stories and the narratives that I was drawn to. And that stays true to me to this day. I'm still pursuing things in line with, with those narratives and those missions and, and those topics. And so I think um, we're very much of the mind that a student knows those things or a parent can know those things about their child from a very early age. They just need to pay attention. And mm. I think this this push toward having students specialize and having students determine what it is that they love and what it is they're passionate about is actually an amazing opportunity for students because if they're able to identify that earlier, I agree with you. I think the world would be so much better off if people were doing what they loved and what they were passionate about and truly excellent at. Um, And then they have this opportunity, these students, um, the ones that are able to identify that interest from an early age to, to benefit in so many other ways outside of building their resume they are able to develop soft skills that are so essential to being a successful adult in this world initiative boldness grit persistence creativity and figuring out how it is that i articulate my passion how how do i find a way in which i can create a list of people that would be after the mission that i'm after they um they develop responsibility and independence. And these are kind of the soft skills that as I've zoomed out and looked at kind of my career and and my interests and and my pursuits as an artist, I've been able to see the connections between the soft skills that my students are developing and then the soft skills that I'm employing as an artist um, in in an extremely competitive field. And so one thing that I was, that I wanted to share a bit were a a couple of those different soft skills and ways in which I see those skills develop in a student as they're pursuing their resume building opportunities. And then the ways Mm. in which I've seen these soft skills develop um, in in my own artistic journey. Yeah, no, I think uh, that would be great to hear from you on that. And I also think that just in general, um, when you're, when I, I've done a bunch of these episodes at this point, right. And, and one of the things that pretty consistently comes through is that, uh, universities want to see not just that, oh, I'm interested in X, but that they're actually doing something about it. Right. And then a lot of times it's the, and then they're doing it consistently and then they're doing, um, they're kind of doing more, they're leveling up within this world, they're maybe even like starting something or they're, you know, trying to take a leadership position in something. I mean, and those are all really just sort of show not tell versions of the same soft skills that you just listed. It's, it's really about kind of going out into the world and actually kind of chasing this thing that you're excited about and that will essentially, you know, hopefully be your career at some point. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think the real win I mean, it's great when kids get into their dream schools. I think that's all well and good. But I think the bigger win is that they become the type of people that attend those schools. They become the type of leaders that um, that are going to lead this world in the future. And that is the win to me. It's bigger than the the name of the school, much bigger than the name of the school that these kids get into. Um, And frankly, you know, it's it's great if you get into an amazing like name brand school, but it's also like just as much of a win that you get into a school that's perfectly aligned with your ethos as a student and um, the place that you're going to thrive the most as a student. So um, all that to say, I think, and and I know that our company is very much of the mind that the admissions decisions are a byproduct of a much more important skill set that these students are developing in building their resumes. Right. Well, and what I thought you were even going to say was um, the more important than getting into the university you want to get into is actually figuring out what you want to do. Right. I think that there are so many uh, millennials. Right. You know, that's who we are. We're like the adults now. (laughs) And we were kind of like a lot of uh, friends of mine or people that I knew kind of went to college to go to college. They got into the best school they could 
based on sort of the the qual the quantitative metrics that they had and they uh oftentimes would get to college and kind of be like okay well now what and that actually first off is um kind of a waste of how expensive college is in, in a way right uh if you can figure that out in high school which is hopefully uh a lot cheaper then yes. that's you know shortcutting that whole learning process a little bit and obviously like if you're a student listening to this like you don't have to have your whole life figured out at 16 like people change their minds and people learn things and that's okay but at least having a direction that you're going to try and you know even if that direction doesn't work out at least you had a direction and you went out in that direction as opposed to kind of graduating from a four year university with like um I don't know, like a communications major or something, and then being like, okay, well, I didn't actually learn what I wanted to do, right? So that that's, I think, it's it's definitely nice that it, this is conversation is starting to happen kind of six years earlier-ish. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's become increasingly important that students, again, don't figure out exactly, precisely the job that you want to do in 50 years or in 20 years or 10 years. That it, that's fine if you know that, but I think that's relatively rare. It's more about, I think, developing the skill set that we were talking about before. That's the real win. Whether or not you pivot into something else, that's, that's kind of up to you. Um, I think what doesn't go away are the skills of self-advocacy and creativity and grit and boldness and persistence. Those are the things that are going to serve you no matter where you end up um, in right. the workforce. Exactly. So... Yeah, definitely. So I think, yeah, this is this is really my passion to kind of talk about the intersection of consulting and, and acting on our artistic work. Uh, so one thing that I that has become increasingly relevant to me lately is the importance of self advocacy. Um, mm -hmm. So as an actor, just for a bit of background, an actor contacts and a professional actor in New York City, and you can imagine there are millions and millions of actors here. They're contacting directors, playwrights, composers, casting directors to stand, stand out in a sea of multiple hundreds, if not thousands of people vying for a single role on a regular basis. This is not just like for Wicked on Broadway or something. It's the casting directors get hundreds and thousands of submissions for one particular role on a single day. And I see that I see that to be so similar to the way in which a high school student has to almost like navigate and think ahead in terms of how are they standing out in the sea of applicants when it comes to undergraduate college admissions. Um, mm -hmm. And so one way that they need to do that is, again, by building the resume in a unique way. So one way that they may start to build their resume would be to contact professionals of all sorts, as I mentioned before. So that might be a researcher or a writer or people in some sort of form of media in their area of academic interest and build a profile by making connections and building opportunities with those particular people in these areas of academic interest that are interesting to the, the high school student to stand out in a sea of applicants with virtually identical metrics. So as we were talking about before, 50% of all high school graduates have an A average. That doesn't, that doesn't make you stand out in the process if you have an A average or you have a perfect ECT or SAT score. Um, those are great things, but it won't make you exceptional. Actually, I was actually just listening to someone talk about how Cornell has an 11% admit rate for students with perfect metrics. And that's so low. So, um, self yeah, I mean, that's, that's better than like everyone else, but not that, I mean, it's still really low. So low. And yeah. And, and you can imagine like if you build a really unique internship, I, I have a student, um, or have had a student who contacted a professional in an area of particular academic interest. And this professional said, oh, we'll build an internship for you because I think what you've pitched to us as your interest is so cool. And we don't have that as part of our organization. And we'd love to just create an internship for you. How much more do you stand out if that's true of you? And that's in your resume, this very unique internship opportunity, than if you have a perfect GPA and a perfect ACT or SAT score, so mm -hmm. much more. <laughs> so um, well, it so also is demonstrated advocacy. interest, right? Like, that's the thing that um, 
and, and that initiative piece, right? Like I think, and even grit because, you know, probably 95% of people aren't even going to answer your email. So it's like it, it, you're really showing the university how much you care about this thing. You're talking about like developing a spike, right? It has to be beyond just the resume aspect of it. And it has to really be like, I want to pursue this. And what would someone who wanted to pursue this do? Well, they would go figure out how to start working on it now, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think what makes those types of reach outs most compelling is when a student is able to formulate a clear articulation of what their passion is, what what the origin of that passion was, how did they know that they were passionate about that particular thing? Because that story is really compelling. When someone's able to say, this, I knew that I was excited about this particular area for this particular reason. Um, and then they're able to connect the dots between what they're passionate about and what the professional that they're reaching out to does. And then all of a sudden, I, to me, it's like, that's so compelling that you're able to find a connection between what you love and what this other person is doing in the real world. And to, it, to me, it's, it's really, in many cases, that connection is just very easily made between the professional and the student um, when they're able to articulate that story in a compelling way and articulate their passion. So, um, so part of this is how can you creatively brand yourself? It's almost like a marketing strategy. How are you marketing your passions and your academic focuses in the world? And are you doing that in a clear way to be able to attract professionals that are doing the same things that you're passionate about? Um, something as an actor I've seen to be particularly valuable as I'm kind of um, illustrating the wide, vast array of submissions that these casting directors get. If you are, as an actor, able to articulate to a director or a playwright who actually wrote the work themselves, why it is that you are so compelled by the work that they've written, they are so much more willing to grant you an audition appointment, for example, um, ahead of the thousands of people that are just submitting for the role because they want to have a Broadway credit on their resume. Um, mm -hmm. So I think a, a student who's able to be bold enough to reach out to the professional and put themselves almost, um, so to speak, in the line of fire and risk the failure that may be attached to putting themselves out there and to be vulnerable enough to say, this is something that I love. I see that you love it too. And here's some value that I could add to, to the way in which you are um, pursuing this interest in the world. Um, I think that's, that's like a huge feat um, for a, a high school student to develop that branding and creativity. Yeah, and I think it's also just um, it, it's going to be things that are going to serve you well in the rest of your life anyway, right? Like, I don't think that there's really a downside to learning these skills. Yes, yeah. I think one of the ones that I find high schoolers struggle the most with is grit. And I think it, it probably is the most valuable of all the soft skills because our kids are sending sometimes hundreds of emails over the course of several months to get involved with a researcher or to get involved with an organization. And then they have to line up interviews and then they finally land that perfect opportunity at the intersection of two of their academic interests um, after sending more emails than they've ever, ever sent in their lives. So I've had students who are really reticent about sending an email to their guidance counselor to follow up on course selection or something. Um, and then by the end of our process, they are Zooming with people in Europe that lead institutions in academic areas they're interested in. Um, so it's pretty crazy the value and the payoff involved in creating or establishing the grit required to succeed in the world. Yeah, well, and I think that it's also, what are universities really selecting for, right? At the end of the day, um, they want somebody who's going to go out and do something in the world. And for better or for worse, uh, you're not really going to get a whole lot done if you're afraid of rejection. Uh, you're also yes. not going to get a whole lot done if you send 10 emails and you're like, all right, I send my emails. And if they don't come back, then they don't come back. And I guess then I have to give up. Like, it, it's you know, it might take 200 emails. It might take more. It, it's, it's more 
Um, it's a way for universities to really feel like you're going to be someone who becomes a good representative of the university in the future. And then the other part of it is that like, they want to make sure you're going to do well in school, like while you're there and they want you to also make sure, or they want to have a sense that you're going to be contributing towards the be- the overall benefit of kind of like campus culture or campus life or the student body or what have you. And all of those things uh, require work and they all also probably require, you know, get, getting knocked down and getting up again. So I think that's really important. Yeah. And the younger you develop grit, the, the basically you'll find yourself in situations where the stakes are higher and higher. You're up for bigger and bigger opportunities. And how valuable is it to establish grit as a young student and then to be able to withstand the failure down the line when you are up for or um, the opportunities that are, are of bigger significance are in, within reach for you, um, if only you had the grit to push through the, the failure and rejection that's inevitable in your pursuit of those uh, higher level opportunities as you grow as a human being um, in, in society. So um, I think like if you don't establish grit early, um, it's harder when you, you have big opportunities that open up in front of you at universities or um, once you join the workforce, it's harder to push through the failure and rejection if you've never seen it before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I agree with all of this. And I think it's all this is all like a great sort of parallel and example here. Um, and at this point, I think that really uh, what I want to kind of start to move towards is like how you as a student can start to think about these things for yourself and how you can start. I mean, we've talked a little bit about like demonstrating interest, meaning and, and showing building these skills by like trying to get an internship for yourself, like trying to get into or, or um, participate in like more selective programs and kind of the base stuff that everybody can do trying to maybe like start a club in your school or like become leader, like become active in or leadership in that club. Um, are, are there any other things that you guys advise or recommend when you're talking to students that, that will help kind of get them on this track towards developing these skills and also developing their spike, as you said? Yeah, I think inevitably as an actor, my first instinct is to say, tap into your emotions. And that is, what gets me mad? (laughs) What infuriates me about uh, what's happening in the world? Or um, what makes me really happy or hopeful or excited about what's happening in the world? What are the stories that I've read in books or watched in movies that make me lean in? So at first, I would work on identifying what is it that kind of evokes that emotion in you? Um, First of all, Second of all, I would make a list of people who are also interested or piqued by that particular topic, and then I'd start to reach out to those people. Um, So I think very simply, it's identifying what interests you or what what, um, piques your interest or what um, makes you, what incites some sort of reaction in you when you look at the world, when you look at the issues of the world. And then who is doing something about that? And then how can you connect with them to be a part of that? Right. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, And then any sort of, I guess, where do you want to take this from here? I feel like we've done a good job kind of covering the philosophy. Is there anything else that you wanted to to talk about today? I think the one last thing that I would say is I have heard a very sad rumor that humanities programs are being defunded by some universities. And I am personally grieved by that because as evidenced by our conversation today, I think humanities graduates have so many translatable skills that are valuable to so many sectors of society. And I think it is an absolute shame that humanities majors are not as valued and are not as invested in And I think there is so much worth in learning how to read and write and articulate who you are, what you stand for. And I just, my hope, I guess, is that students wouldn't feel like 
STEM majors and pre-professional majors are the only route to go in, that there is incredible value in the humanities majors um, and don't be afraid of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think actually, um, I th I, I, so for me, the majors being defunded, it's not like, I mean, I, I don't know if it's because everybody just wants to be a computer scientist now. I mean, I'm sure that that's part of it. There's more computer science graduates now than ever. But um, I think it's more, you know, part of it, I heard uh, that there's like, I think a 40% decrease in humanities applicants at some schools. Like, I think it was like Columbia or some pretty big prominent school like that. Um, or it might have even been you guys, NYU. Um, or... Uh, so, you know, maybe that people think that there's less of an interest in it. And then, of course, you know, you've got chat GPT and AI is coming out. So then now suddenly people are saying, well, wait, what if computer science is no longer going to be the chosen one career that makes you tons of money? Um, I think that the my sort of answer to this is twofold, right? Part one is um, that interpersonal skills dealing with people is always going to be valuable yes. <laughs> and the robot can't do that and won't be able to do that for a very long time in the same way that we can maybe ever but you know certainly it'll take longer for chat gpt to figure out how to care for somebody than it will for them to uh, be able to solve a math equation um, and then sort of part two of it is to me it just is really about like letting you follow your passion no matter what you're going to be doing in this world, right? Like on a different episode, there was someone who was counseling a student who they were really passionate about video games, right? And they played tons of Minecraft and Fortnite. And at first you're like, well, that can't be a college application, right? But then what if they, you know, what they did was they like joined a video game club and they like worked with like that club to like build their own video games on the weekend. And then they you know, got into a program that was focused on on game design and things like that. And then there's plenty of jobs in that, right? There, it's actually a huge industry. And um, it's really kind of your passion, unless it's like maybe for like a couple of sort of very niche things like, like Latin or something that are just like there aren't a ton of <laughs> jobs in today. Like for the most part, like if you're really – good at something or really passionate about something or both, there's going to be a world where you will be successful, right? So don't be trying so hard to focus on, um, you know, being a computer science major because everyone thinks that going to Google is a golden ticket. Uh, focus on what you want to do. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Yeah. Um, great. Anything else or happy to wrap up? Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no, thanks for being on the show. This has been Shift, a college admissions podcast for a changing world, hosted by Tyler from Achievable. <laughs> I don't know why I'm screwing that up. Hosted by Tyler from Achievable with Gabriel Caden, Cadian, excuse me, uh, from Westchester Prep. And Achievable has a great ACT course that you can get a free trial of by going to achievable.me and use the code podcast to get 10% off at checkout.